We're going to start the symposium in a few seconds. Please, I mean, uh, if you could do me a favor to turn off your or put your uh, cell phone on vibration mode. And uh, this is our very f this is our first symposium for the fall 2017. And let me introduce you the, uh, the our first speaker here. It's my pleasure to start the fall. 2017 Silicon Valley Lecture Series with the introduction of Dr. Jerry Marek. He's a senior vice president of the Bosch Research and Technology Center in Palo Alto. Dr. Marek got his MS and PhD in electrical engineering from University of Stuttgart and the Max Planck Institute, Stuttgart, Germany, with some research time spent at Stanford University here. After a postdoctoral fellowship with IBM Research in San Jose, he became a development engineer with HP, optical communication divisions in, 19, in the 80s. He joined Bosch in 1987 as a section manager of sensor development and later became the director of Bosch Sensor Technology Centers. Over his 30 years with Bosch, he advanced the v to VP of engineering for restraint system and sensor then Senior Vice President of Engineering. In 2013, he was named to the position of his now called Senior Vice President of the Bosch Research and Technology Center here in Palo Alto. Once again, please help me welcome Dr. Jerry Mark, Senior Vice President of the Bosch and Technology Center. So hello everybody and uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction.
So with this overview, I wanted to show you some of the examples of our global company. This was a movie going through the whole world with all the applications, all the fields that Bosch is representing. So for my overview today, I would like to tell you a little bit who am I. Then probably lots of you don't know very much about Robert Bosch and the corporation, so I'll show you a couple of slides on this one. My May activity at Bosch was in the MEMS field, so I would like to introduce you to this technology and then show you a little bit what we do over here in the valley, and I will close with a summary. So uh, you did the introduction, but uh, I've got uh, the idea that at this symposium you want to learn a little bit more about the people and uh, the managers that are coming over here. So a little bit about my story and about my life. I was born in the Czech Republic. Uh, the first name is not German, uh, but Czech. Our family uh, fled in 1968 after the Rus Russians occupied the country to Germany. So I've been raised in my teenager years and then also at university in Germany. I had the possibility to get a scholarship um, at the university and uh, with that I was able also to go to abroad and my professors, he supported me and I've got the possibility to be at Stanford. I did some research studies on solar cells, which was a very exciting field at that time. Uh, that was uh, the first years of solar industry when it became uh, popular and went into volume production. After that, I uh, went back to Germany, got my PhD, uh, and uh, after graduating at the University of Stuttgart with a PhD, I started my career as a postdoc uh, down here in the valley in San Jose at IBM. Uh, the research lab, which then moved uh, the next year to Almaden, so that's now the Almaden research lab. IBM had uh, lots of manufacturing in the valley. There was a huge operation with uh, several thousand people in the area of magnetics. So that was the first uh, years of uh, disk storage. The disks were uh, huge, uh, I think 12 inch at that time. If you get an opportunity and you are in, at Stanford, one of the buildings of computer science, they've got the first uh, disk drive, which is about six feet. It was in vacuum and I think it stored uh, 10 or 20 megabytes of, um, of data. So those uh, became smaller and smaller and IBM had a huge uh, operation over the year. They also uh, had lots of volume here and extended to Tucson. That was our sister manufacturing plant and uh, also built one in Europe, uh, in Hungary, uh, and in Germany. After the postdoc, I looked around here and I found a very exciting job with HP in the optical communication division. The optical communication division was making LEDs. HP was the largest, largest manufacturer of uh, light emitting diodes and detectors both for consumer but also for industrial and military applications. That part uh, became actually later on Agilent uh, and uh, Agilent did later on a joint venture together with uh, Philips from Netherlands. Uh, this unit is, uh, has been then named uh, Lumilet and uh, actually it had a management buyout uh, by investors so now it's uh, in 100% uh, owned over here in the US. The division was originally Palo Alto, in, uh, um, where HP started on Page Mill Road and El Camino. And then later on, we moved and expanded onto Trimble Road here in San Jose, close to the airport. And that's uh, where the operations still are. After a couple of years over here, uh, we wanted to move back the, to Germany, my wife and myself, and start a family. I looked around and I found an interesting area, interesting job with Bosch close to Stuttgart in southern Germany. Uh, at that time, uh, there were the first experimental results, uh, the first devices uh, made at University of uh, MEMS. MEMS is called, stands for Microelectromechanical System. Also in Europe, it's called Micromachining. So what people did at that time, they used the silicon wafer, they etched away the silicon oxide, and they took the polysilicon and out of that, they made the first movable structure. So the professors, the researchers at uh, Berkeley and also at MIT, they made the first moving parts on silicon out of uh, the polysilicon on the surface. 
So these were com drives, these were some rotational structures, these were bridges, and with that they wanted to do mechanical structures. Bosch as an automotive company and uh, doing lots of electromechanical parts, the manager, uh, the managing director at that plant in Reutlingen had the idea this might be something for Bosch as well. He had the vision that this, which was pretty crazy at that time, uh, very small, tiny structures without much of application, but that it could be used in the automotive field uh, for sensors, actuators, since Bosch was doing lots of both electronics and mechanical parts. So they looked for somebody, and uh, I was uh, very happy to take that position. I was a trainee at that time to learn about this technology, and then became section manager to build up and investigate uh, this technology. I will show you some of the examples. And uh, to make the long story short, uh, after lots of pain and lots of setbacks, uh, we've been able to go into volume production in 1993 uh, with a pressure sensor for air intake for a fuel management system and we expanded with a lot of applications and I will show you that. In 2005 we also ventured into the consumer electronics field. We started a company called Bosch Sensor Tech which is making those devices uh, for consumer and all of you will have a smartphone and uh, pretty much on every smartphone worldwide uh, there is one Bosch sensor uh, included, measuring uh, acceleration, your rate, pressure, uh, and other values that you can do to sense the environment and uh, what the device is doing. Uh, the MEMS activities are now about 1.2 billion uh, euros, so that would be 1.4 billion US dollars. We are manufacturing 1.6 billion devices every year, so that makes about 4 million every day, which are being shipped both on the consumer and the automotive. So you can see there's uh, quite a bit of those devices out there. Five years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to go to the US <clears throat> uh, and uh, I took over the position of um, heading the research and technology center for Bosch. Bosch has a corporate research operations worldwide um, with main focus in Germany, but lots of activities also in Asia and in, in the US. We have about 1,300 people in corporate research looking for technologies, uh, but also for new applications and uh, business fields for Bosch. And uh, we have 100 people in the US uh, with main uh, activities over here on the West Coast in Palo Alto, but also an office in Pittsburgh and in Boston. We do lots of projects, not only over here, but also with Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh and with uh, MIT. So with that, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, the company. So Bosch, uh, we are now 390,000 employees uh, with 7 billion euros spent on R&D, on research and development. We have uh, a profit of 3.3 billion and uh, about 80, 85 uh, billion US dollars in revenues. So you see it's a very global and a huge corporation. To give you some of the ideas, uh, we are the number one company in uh, supplying parts to the automotive industry. We are number one um, in terms of the following attributes for the motor companies, for the suppliers over here, especially on innovation people management and the use of corporate assets. And we are also in top 100 on Fortune 500 companies. As mentioned in the movie, uh, lots of activities in the automotive field. So we have 60% of our revenues in mobility solutions. We don't call it automotive, but we look into other areas. It's not only automotive parts, but it's also business models, car sharing, um, and those activities. The other 40% are split up in industrial technology. We are in the drive and control and process uh, technologies. You saw, for example, the packaging. Bosch uh, is one of the major suppliers for uh, packaging uh, for sensitive materials like uh, 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 
uh, like food, uh, so it can be stored for a long time and being transported. Energy and building, um, and uh, also consumer goods. Some of the consumer goods you might well know over here as well. We are a major supplier of uh, home appliances, but we are also very active in the power tool area. Lots of companies which have been incorporated into Bosch over the years. For example, Skill, Dremel, those are the brands in the US which are part uh, of Bosch Corporation. Bosch, uh, with its size, uh, is one of the few companies worldwide which is not publicly traded. So uh, we are actually a foundation. And uh, the Robert Bosch Stiftung uh, is the owner uh, of the company. And uh, this is to give you the idea. So Robert Bosch, uh, he started the company 127 years ago in Stuttgart, uh, and uh, he died in 1941. So he was the CEO for a very long time. His children, his family, they didn't want to become active in the industrial space, and therefore he was looking uh, how to run the company in the future. And he had the idea that uh, he will transfer the company, not go onto the public market, but as a foundation. So uh, we have a structure where the Robert Bosch Foundation, the German the Robert Bosch Stiftung, GmbH, officially has 92% of the assets. The Robert Bosch Industrie Freihand is 93%, and this is actually the management uh, structure for the company, the uh, unit. There is still part of the Bosch family, which uh, owns 7% of the company. So obviously they don't have a majority, they don't have very much of influence but 7% of the company gives them pretty good profit, which is distributed to them. Uh, so that's a very nice portion. And they are also still very much engaged with the company. They visit uh, the different manufacturing plants, the engineering locations, not only in Europe and Germany, but also worldwide. And then we have the GmbH, which is actually the Bosch company, and it has only 1% share. It sounds a little bit funny, but uh, this is to give you an example. So we are a foundation. The control of the foundation is by industrial board, but this industrial board doesn't own the company. It's just managing it, and uh, the foundation is the owner. That gives us the possibility to be a company which is oriented to run a professional industrial company, to grow, to generate profits and to generate those profits to grow the company and to keep it uh, well positioned. And the money that we earn goes back to a foundation, not up, goes to the company and to a portion to the foundation. And the foundation is using those assets for quite a bit of topics. So um, this is some of the institutions that we are sponsoring. So the Robert Bosch Foundation over the last decades gave over 500 million uh, out in donations and in activities in the various fields. There is the Robert Bosch Academy, uh, which is in Berlin. There is the Robert Bosch College, which is a universal around the world college, which opened in 2014. We have the German School Academy and uh, the Bosch Stiftung operates a, a hospital in Stuttgart, which is uh, very famous for heart surgery and cancer research, and is also sponsoring uh, studies on pharmaceutical in the pharmaceutical area. A little bit about the uh, U.S. Uh, operations of our company. So in North America, we have uh, 14 billion of sales and 32,000 associates. Very much similar to the worldwide operations in the mobility solutions. Uh, that's the major portion of our revenue with 9 billion and 22,000 associates. So that's even a little bit higher than uh, worldwide. We are at 67%. So as you see, we are a major contributor uh, to the automotive industry in North America. Both the American companies, the big three, but also lots of transplants, the Japanese, uh, Asian, and also European companies. Industrial technology, 1.3 billion. Energy and building at 0.8 billion. 
and in the consumer space uh, 2.4. I mentioned uh, in the home appliance area the Bosch brand, the Bosch brand name. Uh, three years ago, we bought uh, the remaining 50% shares of this Bosch Siemens uh, Home Appliance Corporation. So we own uh, this now 100%. Uh, before, it was a 50-50% joint venture between Siemens and Bosch. In the US, uh, we also carry the brands Thermador and Gaggenau. Uh, Gaggenau being the premium brand and Thermador, a typical American company with lots of uh, appliances uh, designed for the US. That's history of Bosch in North America. Uh, in 1906, Robert Bosch opened uh, the first subsidiary in New York. So you see he was very early on and with that uh, we are now at 100 uh, 12 years uh, in the US, so we are a real American uh, operations with a little bit of setbacks uh, at, during, after the second and the world, second world war, Bosch uh, lost the assets and had to rebuild again, unfortunately. But uh, there's quite a bit of operations. You see all the manufacturing plants uh, and uh, the activities of uh, Robert Bosch in US over 100 locations and 32,000 uh, employees that we have. A little bit about the semiconductors, since this is uh, Silicon Valley. Um, we have um, our own uh, silicon fab uh, in Germany. We actually announced a couple of months ago that we will expand and we will build a 300 millimeter fab in Dresden in Germany to uh, um, increase our volume, our production capabilities, and also the technology outreach to 300 millimeter. Bosch, at the same time, we are buying lots of semiconductors uh, on the market. So Bosch is uh, about uh, one third that we manufacture, two thirds of our, our semiconductor supply we are buying on the outside of our products. And here you see in the automotive space, the semiconductor companies, um, Unfortunately, this is from 2015, number one, NXP, Infineon, Renaissance, and number six, Bosch, uh, with um, 1.2 billion of revenues in this area. With this overview over Bosch, uh, Bosch activities worldwide and also in the US, I would like to tell you a little bit about MEMS. As mentioned before, MEMS stands for Microelectromechanical Systems. So what do we do, want to do? So we want to have devices which consist of a micro-mechanical element, so some very small, tiny structures in silicon, and an electronic part as well. You see what kind of structures we can do. This is a five, 50 micrometer marker. We can produce in silicon very precise, but uh, also very tiny structures which can be moved we can do bridges, we can do membranes, we can do oscillators, and with those we can build all different kind of sensors. This is the ranking uh, from an outside marketing company. Uh, so as you see Bosch over here, the next company being ST Micro, also from Europe, and Knowles, an American company making microphones, InventSense also here in the valley, which are producing the devices and are our competitors in this space. We are one of the first companies which uh, started this uh, operation for volume production, both automotive and uh, consumer. We started the production in 1995. By now we have a combined 8 billion of sensors produced and uh, since we built this technology from the very scratch, we have over 1,000 patents in this area to cover our developments. We do 100% design, both the mechanical design, also the circuit design, the packaging, the system design. We do uh, and control the manufacturing as well. The wafer fab is in Germany, but lots of packaging is happening in Asia, in Europe, and also in the US and Mexico. We've been very happy. In 2008, we've been awarded uh, the German Innovation uh, Prize by the German president. Uh, this is our team with the German president uh, at the time, 2008. And we've been recognized for taking this technology 
this very high innovation, but to industrial application and really serious production. With this, I would like to show, more, to show you some of the examples of what the devices uh, are doing and uh, how they are applied. One of the major uh, contributions is the ESP system, the electronic stability system. And the system on the car is looking at the behavior of the vehicle. We are looking at the yaw rate, the rotation of the car along the perpendicular axis, so how you are driving, and also on the lateral acceleration, uh, how you are uh, going into the curve. At the same time, the system is looking what the driver wants. So we are looking at the driver's commands being the steering angle and the braking pressure. So if you are controlling the car, obviously, you, are, you have the gas pedal, you are accelerating the acceleration. Then you have the steering where you want to go. In the case you want to brake, then you have the braking system. If you have a critical situation like snow, rain, uh, dirt, and you are going too fast, you brake, then the system, the car will become unstable. And this is where the system helps you to really, under very critical situations, to handle the vehicle and to keep it under control. So the system will intervene if necessary, if the car is starting to skid with very small braking pulses on the individual wheels or even intervene with the engine management so it will, will reduce the torque. So let's see if this video is going to play. In everyday driving, it's normal for transverse forces to arise. But when you drive a bit too fast or turn the steering wheel, these forces can negatively affect road holding. Okay. But the Electronic Stability Program ESP nips that in the bud by controlling the brakes, if necessary the engine, and if need be the transmission as well. ESP comprises the following components. A speed sensor on each wheel. The rotation rate sensor measures the car's rotation around its vertical axis. The steering angle sensor registers the driver's steering intention. From the sensor signals, the control unit computes when and how it has to intervene. The hydraulic unit builds up and reduces the braking pressure in the brakes. What happens during the first steering maneuver? The driver has to swerve quickly to the left. The steering angle sensor transmits this to the ESP control unit. But the rotation rate sensor signals that the car is understeering, that is, it's drifting straight ahead towards the obstacle. In split seconds, ESP breaks the left rear wheel very briefly and sharply. This produces the desired counteracting force so that the car responds as the driver intended. What happens when you react? When you pull the wheel over to keep the car in the left lane after avoiding the obstacle, the car tends to oversteer and the rear end tends to break away to the left. The torque to the right is higher than the driver wants. In this case, ESP breaks the left front wheel. The torque is reduced. Instead of going into a skid, the car stays on course, thanks to ESP. So, if you ever get a chance to be on the test track uh, with such a car, it's really amazing. If you can switch such a system on and off, uh, how much uh, it really improves the handling and the performance of the car. If you have conditions where it's wet, where it's oily, uh, where you have snow, it's really amazing how fast the system is reacting and how much of the stability improvements it can actually do. In order to put these systems uh, on the road, uh, we need a very precise and also uh, inexpensive yaw rate sensor. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, such sensors were at a level of several thousand uh, dollars and they were only on uh, cruise missiles or some other military equipment. And we had to take this technology and to bring it into the automotive space and to reduce the manufacturing costs by a huge factor. 
So what we've done over here, we were able to develop a your rate sensor, which is this piece of uh, silicon, and it's assembled onto this chip. We have an acceleration sensor, that's the smaller mechanical part, the small MEMS chip, and the whole thing is on a very complicated and sophisticated circuit for signal evaluation and trimming. To give you an idea what structures we are doing, so this is the inside structure, this is the microelectromechanical components on the silicon wafer. We are using what we call the SMM, uh, the uh, surface micromachining process, where we put the layers on top of the silicon wafer. We make them fairly thick, 11 micrometers thick, so we have a very thick mass. And at the same time, we have a wafer level packaging. We take a second wafer. We place it on top of the first wafer, seal it hermetically, so we have a very robust device where no particles can get inside of these very fine structures. And at the same time, we need a low pressure of 3 millibar so we can run the oscillator at uh, the high frequencies. From the system performance, this gives us uh, the possibility to have a high resonant frequency we run the system at 15 kilohertz. We do anti-parallel motion, so the system is very robust. We designed a mechanical coupling spring, um, so we have this anti-parallel motion, and the high Q factor is giving us stability, noise performance, and this can be only achieved if we have a tight control of the critical processes on MEMS. We have to do very precise lithography and also trenching in order to achieve those parameters. To remind you, this is uh, based on Coriolis force, so back to engineering and physics. In the case you have a rotation and you have an oscillating system, then you get a Coriolis force and this Coriolis force is able to be then shown, detected. So what we have over here on the structure, we have a drive frame, which is this red structure, which puts the whole thing into oscillation. We have a Coriolis frame, which is the part which is um, flexible enough to do the detection. And the detection frame is the one then really detecting the signal as the Coriolis force is putting deviation on the different masses. This is shown over here in this video. So uh, we have this combined uh, your rate and acceleration sensor inside the electronic control unit. As shown over there, this is the your rate sensor. The red electrodes, the drive electrodes, are putting the system into anti-parallel motion. And with a detection frame, we are then able to detect any kind of rotation. The same what you saw before in terms of the situation of the car. Now we have the car rotating. With the rotation, there will be Coriolis force on those moving structures, and the detection frame will be able to detect this deviation. The electronic circuit is pretty sophisticated to do that. Um, so we have the sensing element. We take a voltage, a capacitance to voltage converter, a ADC. We need a gain control and a PLL to run the whole system in the, uh, in the resonating frequency. To detect the signals, we have, again, a capacitive pickup. We do to a C to V converter, uh, ADC, and digital filtering to provide the signal. We need to compensate the temperature effects over a wide range, uh, which is from minus 40 to 85 degrees C. We do the gain adjustment with that, some output filtering, and then the system goes via digital interface to the electronic control unit. We have to do quite a bit of testing, so we have really a very good signal, so we have an inter internal uh, bit control. 
And to give you an impression what kind of sensitivity and what kind of performance such a sister can do, so by the end, at the resolution limit, we have a mechanical sensitivity of five picometers uh, per degrees per second rotation and the electrical sensitivity of two attafarads. So the resolution limit gives us three degrees per hour. So if you look at it, three degrees per hour rotation is pretty small. At that, we have a change on the amplitude of four femtometers, which is just fractions of silicon to silicon atom. And we are detecting at five volts uh, two zeta farads. So at five volts, we are just detecting 0.06 electrons with this type of very small and tiny device. So with these steroid sensors, would like to give you a little bit of impression what we do over here in the valley. So some of the highlights of the research that we've done over here uh, over the last almost 20 years. We've been in the valley since uh, 18 years. We are working on the natural language interaction and one of the systems which we introduced 10 years ago on Cadillac, the Q system, has been awarded with uh, high grades. Overall, the natural language voice controls. Uh, we are working on computer on visual computing, the 3D navigation systems uh, also started about 10 years ago over here at our research facility. We are working on systems to do visual analytics for Industry 4.0. If you have huge amount of data, you have to go and visualize them so you can retect, react and take control. Big data and GPU clusters is one of the research areas over here. Robotics, especially the collaborative robotics, like on the industrial floor, the humans working with the robot. One of the products that we took out of the valley is part of the algorithm and the system on the robotic lawnmower, uh, which is very popular in Europe. It's an electrically charged device and it will do automatically and it will do very nice lane type of cutting on your lawn. Automated driving, um, we've been only a couple of months after Google when we started our automated driving testing on 280. So we've been on the road since 2013 and we logged quite a bit of miles. In April of this year, we announced a collaboration together with uh, Mercedes. The Mercedes company, the Daimler company, uh, has also a research center over here in Sunnyvale. And uh, both companies, Mercedes and Bosch, we joined the forces and we want to accelerate the technology of automated driving and bring it to production sooner with our goal of going for 2022 with volume production. Battery modeling, uh, advanced battery controls, uh, our software, our algorithm are on the Fiat 500 electric vehicle. So battery research and uh, EVs is also a research area of us, as well as physics modeling. The sensors that I introduced to you, the MEMS, and also environmental sensing to complete our areas. We are located in Palo Alto, uh, currently at Veterans Hospital, at the research uh, campus over there. And in November, we will be moving uh, to Sunnyvale, to this new building, which we did a long-term lease uh, in order to expand, and uh, both in terms of the number of employees and our lab space, we outgrew the building that we have in Palo Alto. So we will be moving there tomorrow. Let me summarize. Um, Bosch is a global company, worldwide almost 400,000 people, 80, 85 billion of revenues. It's one of the largest foundation. The motto of the company is invented for life. We try to be strategically positioned and to look into our long-term uh, commitment to the society and to our contribution. We are working in various technology fields and we invest yearly uh, large amounts into corporate research, one of the few companies worldwide which has a large corporate research organization. We are trying to keep up with a pace of innovation, not only with our corporate research, 
but also with internal startups, the Bosch sensor tech, the company supplying MEMS to the consumer field is an internal startup, 100% owned by Bosch, but operated in a se uh, separate way. We have also engagement in external startups. Uh, uh, two years ago, we bought company CEO, for example, in Hayward, which is in the solid state battery space. And we have also a venture capital arm, which is located here in Palo Alto, but also has operations in Asia and in Germany. So with that, uh, we have over 100 uh, researchers in North America, 250 people in the Silicon Valley. And we are very happy to be here, to be part of the ecosystem over here, and to contribute also to the innovation over here. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Too many topics at one time. <laughs> at the same time. Uh, hello. Hey. Um, so your data is kind of outdated. It's a 2015. Do you have what's going on at this moment? Like all your graphs are the latest is 2015 or 16? Uh, the semiconductor data was unfortunately 2015. The revenue data and the amount of employees was for 2016. We published the annual report in April, and that's the 2016 numbers, yeah. All right, thank so, you. Uh, mm -hmm. So the 389,000 employees is uh, as of uh, last year, so as of January of this year. All right, so my question is um, how we as a student can get involved within like your um, sort of foundation, as in like, do you guys offer internships or any programs that you know, the students can get involved in? Yes, we do offer internships uh, actually quite a bit. So in the summertime, we have about uh, 100 interns uh, over here in Palo Alto, um, not only within the research and technology, so not only for corporate research, but we have a total of 15 different business units here in Palo Alto. Uh, being uh, the div division which is uh, working on autonomous driving, but also on robotics or home appliances. So there's quite a bit of topics that we offer for internships. Uh, we do also um, some research with the universities. So sometimes we even have PhDs together with universities since we've been close to Stanford. And then so going back and forth between Stanford and our campus was, um, uh, was very convenient for the students. Uh, the same thing applies for uh, uh, Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, and MIT. Uh, we also offer permanent jobs both within the research and the business units. And as mentioned before, uh, being an automotive company, so almost 70% of our revenues are in the automotive space. So the main uh, engineering is in um, Detroit, in Farmington Hills and Plymouth, and there is uh, very many internships and also permanent uh, opportunities for there. Um, as we are uh, very much a manufacturing company, we have also uh, lots of operations in Mexico uh, in both engineering and the manufacturing and those associates have also the possibility to, uh, to go to Mexico and participate uh, on that engineering part. What responsibilities does your job currently entail? So as mentioned before, um, four and a half years ago, in January 2013, I transferred over here, uh, and I'm managing uh, the Research and Technology Center for North America. Um, the official job title, I'm uh, the a senior vice, uh, vice president at Bosch, at the upper management level. Uh, my responsibilities are overall to manage the uh, operations in North America. Uh, so the department manager out of Pittsburgh and also in Boston is reporting to me. 
So we have a total of uh, seven different departments uh, within the corporate research. Uh, five of them, uh, six of them in Palo Alto and uh, remaining in Boston and Pittsburgh. Since um, I am part of the upper management, I was also running the site over here as we've been growing. But now we have an official site coordinator and manager, so I had also to do you know, the daily operations like um, negotiating, extending the lease, um, getting the things organized, uh, doing them. So my responsibility is for coordinating all the projects, uh, coordinating with the universities, um, um, running really the operations. And uh, at the same time, my supervisor uh, is in Germany and also in the US, so I've got two. Uh, legally wise, I have to have a manager in North America who is Mike Mansuti. Mike Mansuti is heading over all the North American operations, so that's not only US but also Canada and Mexico. And my supervisor, uh, target wise, is uh, Michael Bolle. He is located in Germany and he's running the corporate research. And he's reporting directly into Volkmar Denner, uh, our CEO. So um, I've got only two management levels up to our CEO, to, uh, to Mr. Denner. So there's quite a bit of interaction with Germany and coordinating those projects worldwide. So the projects that we do within corporate research are really global. So for example, we have battery research, which uh, most of that is happening in Germany because that's where the systems are. But we have operations over here. I mentioned before we bought a startup um, to supplement our technology in the solid state. We have some colleagues uh, in uh, Shanghai, in China, working on materials. So those projects are pretty much run worldwide. So I think that's one of the advantages of the company. It's so huge, so you can change to many different topics. But you are also running a global project, so you get lots of interaction with both uh, the colleagues in Europe and in Asia. So in the introduction part, I noticed there's a smart home project area in from Bro. Yes. So I'm just curious about how it's going on uh, globally as well as in our Silicon Valley. Is there anything related to smart home IoT things, research, both research and applications? Yeah. So on the smart home side, um, I mentioned before the different areas. So I think Bosch, as uh, this very wide technology, we are in an excellent position for the smart home because Part of our, our activities is the home appliances. So we are producing uh, refrigerators, freezers, ovens, washing machines. Uh, Bosch has also, didn't mention that explicitly, uh, lots of activities in the home uh, heating field. So um, uh, gas um, heaters um, are made uh, in worldwide and Bosch is uh, manufacturing those. And at the same time, um, being electronics on the car, so in the integration of the home even with a car. So the connectivity and the smart home is one of the big topics. And uh, we have a home, smart home division, which we started a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, here we are uh, developing and manufacturing uh, the controllers and the apps uh, to run such systems. So with a smart home, uh, from Bosch, uh, you can run the security system. We have also security system operation on the industrial side, uh, control the ambient line, control the heating, and uh, into the home appliances. Uh, so quite a bit of activities to integrate that. And lots of research opportunities as well. Uh, we have been part in Pittsburgh uh, together with Carnegie Mellon um, on a smart campus project which has been running over five years. We as Bosch, we've been installing sensors and sensor nodes and uh, Carnegie Mellon has been integrating these into a prototype lab, into the site uh, hall. So uh, the applications was to manage a campus like a small smart city, uh, looking for example at occupancy, at temperature, to run the system more efficiently. So there are occupation system, temperature sensors, and uh, we are installing and install the different sensor nodes. So for example, uh, if the 
classroom is not used, you can turn off the lights, so you can turn down the air conditioning, save energy. In the case there are some people in the building, uh, they are by themselves, you can uh, provide the security for them. And so that has been one of the projects together with CMU. And we are expanding this into a prototype even with a, a big uh, hall in, in Pittsburgh. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming to talk today. Um, I wanted to ask you, where do you see Bosch 100 years from today? <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious because there's a lot of talk of uh, like artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. self, oh, everything being automated. So is this like a space that Bosch sees himself being a key player in? Uh, well, that's a tough one, right? Uh, I mentioned before, so uh, uh, the company now being close to 130 years old, uh, at the same time, we are a foundation, and Mr. Den is number seven CEO. Uh, so if, you know, over such a long period, you see we have lots of uh, stability uh, in terms of running the company in a strategic way, and uh, the company managed a lot of transition uh, through the different periods and also very tough times. Uh, 100 years is a long time. I think artificial intelligence uh, will take place sooner, uh, not 100 years from now, but uh, in, in the next decade for sure. We are working on that also very heavily over here, and we are also working uh, uh, on the ethical aspects as well. So, uh, you know, the transition of the manufacturing of the, of the society, so where we are also in touch with some of the universities over here, looking not only in the artificial intelligence in terms of technology, but looking really into the change uh, society and, and how it's changing. So that's one of the aspects that we are working as well. And we want to keep up, keep up with that innovation and contribute to the society in that area as well. We are a huge manufacturing. Uh, we have only 250 manufacturing plants. Um, a very high portion of our associates are in the area of manufacturing. So the whole change of um, artificial intelligence, not only for us as customers and users, but also on the manufacturing side, that's quite a bit of impact as the robots, uh, the uh, industry 4.0 is changing the production, manufacturing, uh, distribution space. Uh, we are very heavily in that. But I hope uh, the company will be around for another not only 100, but also 130 years. Uh, but it's a challenging task uh, for everybody, uh, for the company and the management.